Hey guys, uh, my name is Jerry. Uh, good to get to meet you all, and, and thanks, Mind Stevie, for hosting me. Um, the talk is called Unlock LLM Capabilities Over Your Private Data with Llama Index. My name is Jerry. I'm the co founder and CEO of Llama Index. Some of you might have heard the tool already uh, or, or even play around with it. Um, we do have a MindsDB integration as of about yesterday, and so I have a few slides. I'm super excited to showcase that. Um, a lot of this talk is also about the core capabilities of Llama Index, and I think there's just a lot of opportunity to continue deeper integrations with uh, MindsDB as well. Um, cool, so I'm super excited. Let's, let's get started. Um, some, for some of you who might have like seen some of my previous talks, uh, the basics are, are pretty um, straightforward, uh, but I'll just go through some of the basic context and motivation for a tool like uh, Llama Index. So LLMs are you know, great. Uh, they're pre-trained on a lot of data. Um, they can be used for a lot of different types of use cases. Typically, uh, a lot of people, you know, pretty much everybody building an app thinks about how do you augment LLMs with your own uh, private data, right? And so you have like, um, you know, raw files like PDFs, vector databases, APIs, et cetera. So I think one of the, uh, the there's like basically two techniques that, or, or kind of like two classes of techniques that you could do. Um, and the jury's still out as like, you know, like what, what's gonna be the long term of this? Uh, one is fine tuning. So like how do you actually bake knowledge into the weights of the network? Like you just train the model, you know, by training the model on new data, the model's gonna memorize stuff. If you use ChatGPT and just ask it about anything on Wikipedia, it's gonna know about it, right? because it's trained on that data. So if you just train the model, it'll be able to memorize information. There's downsides right now. Um, you know, there's also kind of like new advancements like LoRa on top of open source models that have show some promise for fine tuning, but in general, it's pretty expensive and requires like a decent amount of like compute and also upfront effort to actually get working. Um, in terms of like what most people are doing these days, if you want to do like, oh, chat GPT over your private data, you do something like in context learning, right? You set up some retrieval augmented generation system where you have a knowledge corpus, put it in maybe like a vector database, and then you have like an input prompt that basically says like, you know, like here is some context, do a retrieval on top of the knowledge corpus context, and then you're able to kind of like answer the following question in order to give, uh, to, to give you the response. Like you send this entire input prompt in or, uh, into the language model, and you'll get back a string response. Um, general questions to think about as you do this is what exactly is a retrieval model? What exactly is a synthesis model? How do you retrieve the right context for the prompt? How do you deal with like, you know, overflowing context? How do you deal with like just a diverse range of like different types of data, uh, like gigabytes, terabytes of data? How do you trade off between performance, latency, and cost? So many of you might have already been uh, familiar with these challenges if you try to set up like some sort of retrieval augmented system on your own, either using you know Llama Index, LangChain, or other toolkits. Uh, but there is just a lot of complexity in here, and I think that was part of the motivation for a project like Llama Index. So. Llama Index itself is a data framework uh, for LLM applications. Um, it contains uh, basically like a data management and query engine toolkit for building your LLM application. So it offers a few different components across the data lifecycle to help you, you know, like basically deal with your data uh, to, if you want to build an LLM application on top of it. This includes ingestion, this includes uh, indexing, and this also includes uh, data querying. So if we look at uh, data ingestion, uh, which you know, um, is, is one of the first steps if you want to actually build an application, um, you want to load in data from an existing data source, whether it's like your own local files or your APIs or you know, a database, and load it into a format that you can use uh, with, with you know, the language model. Um, so we offer this through a, a site called Llama Hub, which is just like a community-driven hub of uh, data loaders. Uh, that you can just plug and play into your own LLM app. Uh, we have like over 100 of them in there, and you can use it with uh, either Llama Index or uh, LangChain. The next part is how do you actually structure and store this data, right? And we talked a little bit about this during the developer panel too, but like, you know, like there's just a very basic way of doing it, which is you take some unstructured text and then, you know, you, you split it up and then throw everything into a vector database. But once you actually start thinking about kind of like performance requirements and actually getting the best results from your queries, you might need to do some additional work both in terms of the structuring as well as the like querying in order to give you back a good query performance over your data if you're gonna use LLMs on top of it. And very closely related to this is that, you know, there's, there's being able to store the right state uh, so that you can retrieve it later. And then how do you actually, you know, 
use this to build the right like retrieval and query interface on top of your data. So given some sort of input prompt, you know, retrieve relevant context and synthesize a knowledge augmented output. Um, here's just a, a basic diagram of, of how Llama Index works. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen like uh, carpet these like Microsoft talk. No one? Okay. Well, they gave like a shout out to Llama Index at the kind of like end of it. Uh, and and we he used like slides that were about like three months old and so we were a little embarrassed by the diagrams and so we like updated it a little bit. And so this is kind of like the diagram that we've been using for the past uh, past few weeks. Um, so Llama Index, we see ourselves as like a data framework for LLM application development. Um, the idea is that, you know, any sort of knowledge intensive LLM applications that you're building, we see ourselves as like a fundamental module, right, in your overall toolkit to build this type of application. Because we help manage the ingestion, you know, the indexing and querying. And you can actually use this as part of some outer, uh, you know, loop such as like an agent in like LangChain or ChatGPT plugin. Uh, part of what we want to do is give you like the really good tools that work with your data, right? Either tools in the traditional sense or tools that you can use with an agent. Um, and the idea is that you um, can basically build this black box around your data so that you send in some sort of rich query description of like the input prompt that you want to solve. The output is basically the like uh, knowledge augmented response with the appropriate references, actions, and all those different things. Cool. So, you know, part of this talk is just going through some of the different high level components of Llama Index for, the, for those of you who aren't familiar. And then, uh, you know, probably the most uh, more interesting part is actually starting to go into some of like the use cases that you can actually solve, uh, as well as the integration with uh, MindCB. So the first part here is the data connectors uh, powered by Llama Hub. So data connectors uh, are uh, the basically first steps of loading data into your LLM application. And it allows you to easily, uh, Llama Hub allows you to ingest uh, any kind of data from, from a lot of different places. We have 100 different data loaders. Uh, it's powered by this uh, you know, community-driven GitHub repo with like a website layer on top. Uh, and you can basically load information from diverse data sources from Notion, Slack, Discord, to files like, again, PDFs, PowerPoints. Uh, there was a question about how do you do you know, extraction from PDFs and charts. Uh, I wouldn't say we have like a great answer for that yet, but you know, we have some basic ability to extract info out of like a PDF. Um, and the idea is, you know, in a few lines of code, uh, for the, for, I'm not sure how clear this is on the screen, but you, know, you just do like from Llama index import download loader. It's not a package actually that you can import from PyPy. You, uh, in a few lines of code, you can like, you know, set up the loader, load in the data, and then you can actually convert this into a document that you can use with Llama index or uh, your LangChain application. The next part is just kind of thinking a little bit about our philosophy about how you manage data and store state uh, within an LLM application. So if you think about just like a collection of notes, right? Let's start with Notion. You have a collection of notes. And these are your source documents. Your source documents are going to be stored in some sort of like data collection, right? And so those source documents can be stored in like uh, in memory document store or MongoDB or, you know, we have integrations now for S3, uh, like DynamoDB, a lot of these different uh, kind of like document and object stores. On top of that, you're gonna define indexes, which are basically views on top of your data, right? One way of thinking about indexes is like, like face is an index, which stores an embedding for every piece of data that you have. Uh, but there's other ways you can try to index into your documents, like with keywords, uh, with other types of like, with summaries even, um, so there's like, Basically, you know, a database index is just like a way to kind of like slice your data uh, or, or kind of like define this metadata that allows uh, you to do efficient querying. We're kind of taking that analogy, applying it to the LLM space and, you know, like uh, providing some sort of layer that the LLM can use when it needs to actually query and traverse your data. So like vectors, embeddings, uh, keywords, summaries, those are our examples of indexes or state that you can store. The next module that uh, some of you might be familiar with is this idea of like a retriever, right? A retrieval module uh, takes in some sort of input query and it gives you back relevant results for your query. Um, and so, you know, the key goal is to really just like fetch the set of documents that are relevant to the query that, that you're running. If you think about a retriever on top of a vector database, 
Uh, it's basically the query interface to a vector database, right? Uh, the, this query interface is just like, you know, top K embedding lookup uh, or, you know, some other fancier techniques like max margin relevance or uh, what's some other ones like, um, you know, do, doing a similarity score cutoff or, or using like SVM or something. Now that you retrieved the set of documents, which, you know, for a lot of like retrieval augmented generation pipelines is one of the key components, the next step is some sort of uh, query engine. So you retrieve these documents and now you want to actually feed these retrieved documents into the language model to synthesize the response, right? And so you figure out a way to like stuff this into the prompt and deal with like prompt overflows, like if the retrieve context actually overflows a prompt and you have some like response synthesis strategy um, to, to, you know, like a chain calls to LLM if you will. And then finally you get back this like final response. Oh, and, and well, you know, with, within our constructs, we call that like a query engine. I'm just gonna move this jacket. So. Um, okay, so, you know, clearly we think a lot about like data and LLMs and maybe just like a little bit of a note on how we think about like storage, right? Like how, how should we think about like storage with respect to building an LLM application? So. This is kind of like a relatively recent architecture that we created, um, and the idea is that, uh, you know, there's different ways that you can store uh, documents within your LLM application. Um, probably the most common one is this one right here, where you just like have an end-to-end -end vector store interface that uh, can both store the source documents as well as embeddings. Uh, if you look at a service like Pinecone, Weave 8 or Chroma, they allow you to do both, right? You can store like full documents, well kind of, like Pinecone has like a bit of a metadata limit. Weave 8 I think doesn't give you a bound so you can store arbitrary text in there. But for all intents and purposes, you can like store text data within a vector store and index it along with an embedding. Of course, like there's other ways that you can try to do storage as well. Um, you can try to store like the chunks, like the text chunks into some sort of traditional document store interface. So this includes like our, our Mongo integration, S3, and other storage providers as well. And you also need to have some sort of storage solution for these like indexes, like the state that you defined on top of your existing documents, you also need to store that somewhere, right? And you can also store that in, in the key value store as well. I think this part is actually pretty basic. And so, uh, you know, we have some initial integrations uh, in terms of like generic key value stores. Um, but if you guys are interested, uh, we would actually love contributions here. Um, we have some basic integrations on the key value stores. And then we have like uh, over 12 different vector store integrations. Uh, but you know, there's just a lot more storage providers that we'd love to integrate with. So maybe just for the sake of example, we can walk through a little bit of uh, some of these constructs and, and talk a little bit about how it works. Um, and then after this, I'll, I'll showcase, you know, how this can be used uh, with uh, MindCB. So, the first step is, let's say you have like two Notion documents as well as a PDF document. So those are source documents. Um, you do this like ingestion step, so you load the data from these source documents, and then you do this indexing step. So you like dump these documents, um, feed it through some parsing step so that they're chunked up, and then you store it into like a vector store, right? And so imagine this is just like some generic vector store. Uh, each chunk can be represented by like a node object with an embedding. And then during query time, right, um, we, I guess we don't actually show explicitly the retrieval and synthesis steps, but this part, you know, you, you first get an embedding for the query, you set the top K value to two, um, and then, you know, you send the query embedding to the vector store and fetch the most sil uh, similar nodes to the query. That is your retrieval step, right, on top of a vector store. And then once you actually do retrieval, you fetch, say, the top K, uh, top two most relevant nodes given the query, and then you send the, the, the set of nodes plus the query into our response synthesis module. And that part is the next step. So after you do retrieval, you want to do synthesis, right? You want to actually synthesize the answer uh, given the retrieved uh, text chunks. This part actually is pretty interesting too, because I think you know, there's like different ways of trying to synthesize a response given some set of like retrieved context. Um, if, for instance, like your retrieve context actually overflows a prompt window, like uh, for GPT-3, it's like 4,000 tokens. Let's say you retrieve like 10,000 tokens worth of context. How do you actually resolve that, right? 
uh, of course, if it's like anthropic flood, you just like dump the entire document in there, right? Because it's 100K, you don't have to worry about anything. A life is good. But if you're using like GPT-3 or using any sort of like, you know, open source model with a smaller context window, you're gonna have to deal with some sort of response synthesis strategy. Uh, there's basically two steps. I think, you know, both uh, like we and LineTrain have like roughly similar uh, response synthesis strategies or just like call different things. This is like the sequential strategy or create and refine. So you can like uh, iteratively go through the different nodes that are retrieved um, and basically uh, chain LLM calls in like sequence. So you start with the first node, um, send the query to the first node, uh, feed in some prompt, get back an answer. So it would look something like, you know, here's some context, first node's context, here's the question, give me back the answer. For subsequent nodes, you can do some sort of refinement step where you basically say, here's the previous answer, here's some more context, now given the question, uh, see if you want to like refine the existing answer. And you just keep doing that in sequence until you get back a final response. It works decent, it, it preserves like a decent amount of detail. The main issue with this is that, you know, it's pretty slow. There's also this next step called uh, tree summarization, where uh, in line training is called MapReduce. But, you know, you basically just like distribute a bunch of, uh, you know, parallel calls across each node, synthesize an initial answer across each node, and you like hierarchically combine the summaries um, so that you can uh, uh, synthesize a final response at the end. Sweet. Um, there is a basic tutorial on how to use the you know, Llama Index, Llama Hub, uh, the query interface. Um, I can send these slides after, uh, honestly, so that you guys uh, can just like get access to some of these resources. Um, one of the high level ideas here is that uh, with Llama Index, uh, here, let's try opening this up. Um, Llama Index provides like a pretty like nice and intuitive interface for kind of just like easily injection, indexing and querying of your data. If you wanted to do that with like the most simple step possible, I guess I'm leaking my OpenAI key, but that's fine. Um, you can just, uh, like do that in basically three steps, right? And, and it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is um, first, load in the data, and then two, uh, index the data, and then three, you query the data. Um, of course, that's like great if you're a beginner user, if you're a more advanced user, you're gonna want a bit more customization. Um, how do you do customization? You can actually customize any of these modules I just talked about. You could define your own data loader, you could define your own index, you could define your own retriever, uh, your query engine, and you can swap in a bunch of more advanced stuff. And, and I'll get into that in, in just a bit. Um, but this is the basics of what you can do. Cool. So as of yesterday, um, we uh, added an integration with MindsDB. Huge shout out to the team uh, for, for kind of coming up with this. And I'm excited to present how this could work with uh, the MindsDB SQL interface. So I think one of uh, the first things that you can do is you can basically create a model, right? And the model could be called, you know, like my QA model. And it can use Llama Index itself as like an underlying engine, if you will, with a set of parameters. Um, the basic, uh, let me see if I can zoom in. Okay, anyways. Um, the basic parameter here is um, we, we set some index class. In this case, it's just like a vector store index. So, so this is the, the standard, you know, like uh, do top K index, or do indexing and the top K retrieval. Um, you set some input column, and then you know you define some authentication credentials like the OpenAI API key. And what you can do is once you have this model, this kind of like seamlessly plugs into the MindCB framework, so you can run queries over this model and actually kind of view results in a nicely structured tabular format. So, for instance, if you run a SQL statement like uh, select question answer from MindCB dot MyQA model where question equals, you know, what problem does MindCB solve? Um, and, and this, you know, uh, like will hit the model, which has access to your entire knowledge corpus, and then you can actually get back an answer right here. Another example here is that you could do select question answer from MindCB, where question equals who founded MindCB. And similarly, you know, it's basically just running the kind of like engine or of retrieval augmented generation under the hood, and then you can get back an answer right here. Of course, you know, 
you want to like ideally in, in some sort of like more real world data use case, you probably have some like data bank of questions that you want to ask and it's nicely structured in a tabular format and you want to use the full capability of SQL. So you can do something like, you know, select question answer from model um, and then do some join with a question table, right? And this table contains a set of questions that you might want to ask over your knowledge base. So, you know, the question table might contain these three questions, like who founded MindZB, what problem does MindZB solve, where is it located, you get back the answers over here. Um, okay, cool. That's a basic integration. Um, so high level thoughts, this is just an initial step. We're honestly super excited to partner with the, the team a little bit more closely. Um, one potential option is that we actually also have um, like a text to SQL interface. And so if you can, you know, basically given a natural language query, compile it to, you know, the, uh, this like uh, SQL declarative uh, interface, um, you can basically have Llama index integrate on both ends, both as like the caller as well as the engine within uh, MindCB. Let's go through maybe just like a few basic use cases of things that you can do over your data. Right, and we'll start from like basic to advanced. And, and these are all things that you can do with Llama Index. And, and maybe just like to talk a little bit about how this fits in with the broader ecosystem. We see Llama Index as a set of like key data tools that you can run uh, when building your LLM application. You can use it as a standalone framework if you want, um, or you could actually plug it into some sort of outer agent abstraction. Like for instance, if you are building uh, lane chain agents, uh, you can actually use this as like a set of like pretty good tools to solve like specific tasks over your data. And some of these tasks are gonna be listed in these slides. So the most basic thing that you can do is just use it for semantic search. And, and I said you can basically do this in like four lines of code. Um, you load in data, get some documents, uh, index the data, um, you know, initialize the GPT vector store index, define a query engine, and then do query engine dot query, what did the author do growing up? And this just does the classic, you know, do top K retrieval from your vector store, we integrate with all the other vector stores if you, if you want to use those, and then you know you can synthesize the response. Another thing you can do is uh, summarization, right? So like given some uh, set of data, you can basically, um, you know, instead of just fetching the top K most relevant items from that data, you can define this thing called like a list index over any subset of data, and then you'll basically retrieve everything in that list during query time, and basically try to stuff it all into the prompt uh, uh, during query time to give a response. And so when you, you do want retrieval across like pretty much everything, if you want to ask any sort of summarization questions. We also, for instance, have these basic ideas of like a router abstraction. I think this is just like a very first step towards what we call building like a unified query interface. Because um, what you want to do is, you know, like you might have different tools suited for different tasks. How can you provide like one central interface that can basically give in any sort of question you might want to ask decide what tool you might want to pick in order to uh, retrieve the best result, right? And this is starting to get into kind of like, you know, agent-like territory. If you think about what an agent is, it's basically just like an automated decision engine, right? And so this is just one way of using LLMs to do some sort of automated decision making, uh, specifically routing a query to like the right underlying tool. And so for instance, in this uh, case, uh, the diagram basically says, um, you know, what did the author do during his time in art school, right? And let's say you have a query engine uh, over a vector store that can do top K retrieval. And you also have another query engine that's optimized for summarization. Uh, this router can choose, uh, you know, given this query, it's probably better suited for vector store retrieval instead of going through everything. And then you can actually hit the vector index, get back the top K, and then synthesize an answer. Um, we also have text to SQL. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this really quick just to go through some of the other stuff. But there's a guide linked here. We actually have a bunch of stuff around text school that I would love to talk about. The next use case here is um, document comparisons. Um, if you look at a lot of these like kind of chat over your data applications, a lot of them are kind of optimized for cases where you have either like a single document or you dump like you know a bunch of documents into the same index and like a vector store. There are certain cases, uh, for instance, like uh, one example is just like compare and contrast queries that you explicitly want a bit more structure in how you actually execute these queries across multiple documents. So for instance, let's say you want to compare the 2021 10K filings for Uber and Lyft. Um, the question is basically, you know, compare and contrast the customer segments and geographies 
that grew the fastest. Um, I realize this diagram, well, that's okay. Yeah, it's probably too small for you guys to, to kind of see, but I'll just try to like uh, uh, describe it in words. Imagine you have like two different indexes. One is for the Uber 10K document. Another is for the Lyft 10K document. You send in this top level query. Um, we have a construct that you can actually break down this query into some sort of query plan, right? And this query plan specifically will create two subqueries. What's the revenue growth of Uber from 2020 to 2021? And then what's the revenue growth of Lyft uh, to 2021? Once you actually have these two subqueries, um, then you can execute them, uh, right? Well, this is like automated decision making. Execute them against the relevant indexes that the uh, language model thinks are relevant. And then that execution is just a standard like top K vector store retrieval, right? You can like uh, define like a vector index, execute these queries against it, synthesize an answer for each of these. And then once you execute the subqueries, it'll say something like the revenue growth of Uber, you know, uh, to 2021 was 57%. And the revenue growth of Lyft uh, from 2020 to 2021 was 36.7%. And uh, finally, you would combine everything uh, in, in, in the final answer. So this, for instance, uh, is just an example of a construct that we've created that is really optimized for this purpose. Right, and, and it's kind of like, it's kind of an in-between between something that's like completely explicit and hard-coded versus like unconstrained agent-style interaction because it's still targeted towards this use case of document comparisons, but in the end, you're relying on the LLM, some sort of agent-like behavior within the LLM to break down that question for you for kind of a more constrained use case, if that makes sense. Another option, which I might skip because uh, it's kind of getting a little bit too in the weeds, uh, you can define like a graph structure of your data. You can actually explicitly like say, you know, like link the, the kind of like uh, two vector stores and a high level graph. And then through the graph structure, you can also perform compare and contrast queries. Another uh, kind of example use case here is iterative multi-step queries over a document source where you can break down a complex question into a lot of simpler ones. And so for all of you who are familiar with like chain of thought prompting, this is basically a chain of thought prompting, but constrained with the use case of being over a single data source. So for instance, if your question is like, who is in the first batch of the Acceler accelerator program the author started, and you're asking this against like a single data source, you can first ask the LLM to infer like an initial question, like what accelerator program did the author start? They started YC. Uh, this is like the Paul Graham essay that we, that we typically use. Um, once you get back this, then you can actually infer our next sub-question, who is in the first batch of YC's accelerator program. You know, this program uh, included startups, like, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, once you, the model reasons that it's actually finished answering everything, then you can return none and then synthesize the final answer here. If you take a look at this, it's not that dissimilar to like, for instance, like a React style loop but the prompts are different and the outputs are more constrained. Because again, the, this whole purpose is to try to like answer complex questions over a single data source. It's not trying to necessarily be kind of like a auto GPT style, like uh, try to do everything. Some other use cases that I think are just good tools in, in the toolkit to play around with is how do you exploit like temporal relationships in your data, right? And so what if you want to actually retrieve additional context in the past or in the future. So for instance, like what did the author do after his time at Y Combinator? You ask this question, if you hit like the vector store with embedding based retrieval, you're gonna fetch just the relevant information about Y Combinator, right? Even though you asked about like what, what happened after the time. That's just kind of like how embeddings work. It's like one of the downsides of it. I think one thing that we can do is some sort of additional post-processing step where you retrieve the context and you can actually sequentially look at future nodes uh, in order to kind of like augment the L1 synthesis step with more context. A related use case is recency filtering where you know we've actually talked to a few kind of like enterprise users where they have like, you know, like patient history or records or any sort of documents that contain like duplicate information and some of it is a little bit out of date. Um, and then when you do top care retrieval, you want to make sure you actually, you know, like uh, retrieve the most recent ones first. Uh, there's different strategies for doing this. You can do a mathematical formula, like time waiting. Um, you can also, for us, like you can do that too, but you can also do some sort of like recency filtering. So once you retrieve some sort of top K, explicitly filter out outdated information, right? So that you can just retain the most recent information. This last use case that I think uh, I'm, I'm personally pretty excited about 
is um, this idea of like kind of joint text to SQL as well as uh, semantic search. Um, so it's kind of this idea that um, if you think about SQL, it's a great, it's very expressive and it works very well over structured data. Um, how can you basically kind of like take the power of SQL and kind of like if you also have a bunch of unstructured data that's stored in a vector store, combine it with some sort of like interface, um, like basically join information from your structured database with uh, unstructured context from your vector database. So as a very basic example, let's say you have a question, like um, tell me about the arts and culture of the city with the highest population. Um, I know it's pretty zoomed in, but let's say you have a bunch of Wikipedia articles about cities and you have a table containing population statistics about like each city uh, as well as the population. If you ask a question like this, like what's the arts and culture of the city with the highest population, you probably first wanna query the, the SQL database uh, and run text to SQL, like figure out what the city with the highest population is. And then once you actually figure that out, you want to join it with information from your vector database that contains a lot more unstructured text about what the what uh, each uh, city actually contains. Right, and, and so the city, you know, let's say it's Tokyo, then you want to go ahead and query the vector database. Okay, what exactly is kind of like the arts and culture scene in Tokyo? And then you get back a response. I think it's nice, basically, you know, to give you some context, like what we're always thinking about is what exactly is the complexity in your data system, right? Is it like you have a bunch of like tabular and also unstructured data? How do you model these relationships? And basically, how do you define the right query interface so you can get back, uh, again, the results that you want? Last slide, uh, just some integrations with the overall ecosystem. I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, you can use Llama Index as like a standalone module over your data, right? Like what we kind of focus on really is at that interface uh, between uh, your private data and language models. So with us on, on our own, you can build like basic uh, kind of, or not basic, but like you can build like nice like QA over your docs or kind of like chatbot experiences over your docs. You can use different modules within Llama Index. For instance, you can use it as like an ingest and query layer on top of your existing storage system, given our storage abstractions. You can use data loaders from Llama Hub on their own. Um, a lot of people use our data loader use cases, uh, whether you're using, for instance, Llama Index or Langchain. Um, you can use like the document retriever modules uh, that we created for kind of like pure information retrieval use cases, uh, even without feeding it into the language model. And a very popular use case is you can basically use us as like a data tool within an agent, right? Like let's say either you know, you just want to get something working with like a vector store and like three lines of code and just use that to index data and use it with the agent. Um, or you want to define kind of more interesting modules over your data and use that with an agent framework, like line chain, semantic kernel, like ChatGPT, like these are all things that you can do as well. Um, and we're slowly building out the kind of like experimentation uh, prototyping integrations with a lot of other services, um, like uh, Vellum, Aimstack, uh, a lot of other companies too. Cool, I think that's it. Thank you. No. Thank you very much. Are you okay with a couple minutes of questions? Because oh, that's yeah. a lot of stuff and that was really cool, actually. So questions, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, starting on the side, Tom. Uh, I'm super interested in how query decomposition works. Uh, could you give us a, like an overview? Yeah, um, for those of you who uh, are kind of familiar with like the React framework, it's it's roughly similar, just maybe like a slightly different prompt. Um, the prompt looks something like, here's like a question, um, here is what the knowledge source uh, represents. Given this question, see if you can break it down into sequential questions, right, over a knowledge source. And you can either do this in a sequential manner, which is this like multi-step interface. You have this like query, and then you break it down into you know, uh, sequential steps. And what that means is you wanna wait to get a response before you ask the next question. Or you could generate a query plan beforehand, right? And, and that part's very interesting too. Like for instance, the document comparisons, you, even like you know, before you get any response, you just know if you wanna compare revenue growth to uh, Uber and Lyft, you wanna have a query plan that's able to ask both data sources and join it at the end. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, how do you see the roadmap for Llama Index? Do you see this more as uh, like a sort of collection of utilities or more like a framework that, that uh, applications would be built on top of? 
Yeah, uh, probably a little bit of both. Like, I, I think we're um, inherently a little bit less like broad, for instance, than Langtrain. And ideally, we see them as like complementary, where we focus a lot on kind of like the data ingestion indexing side. And then we also provide some like nice query modules over your data. Um, that, at least on the open source side, I think we, we do want to just like provide things of value, and especially over different types of data use cases. Uh, and so a lot of these, what, what I showed here is kind of like these different types of like analytics, basically, use cases over your data. Um, there is also a question that, you know, like we, we are a company, uh, eventually we'll probably like figure out some way to like support enterprise users a, a bit deeper, but our main priority right now is open source. Thanks so much. I have two questions. One is to you and one is to the, the folks at MindsDB. Uh, the first one is about the, the router. I think that, that, yeah. that's super exciting. Um, do you have to define the rules yourself or are these inferred kind of from the query? Um, uh, oh, oh, I see. So I think um, the way a router works is it's just a picker, right? You, you just give it the choices that it has access to, some metadata for each choice so that the language model has information on what each choice is about. And then you just have a question, and then it'll output a choice, right? That, that's the idea. And you could do like output formatting, make sure that the choice is correct, and all these things. But yeah. uh, super cool. And then the, the second one is about uh, the demo that you showed. So when you joined in the the, the, the the questions table, right? Oh yeah. I realized how quick that was, and I think this is the second time we see that today. There was another use case with mm -hmm. um, the sentiment, I, I think. And the question is to to to, to guys at MindsDB: Are these queries parallel parallelized? Like when? When, when you run this, uh, are the API calls going parallel or like, like, be, be, because I was surprised how quick that was and I would be wondering about larger tables. So it kind of depends on the sort of how many rows you have and also where you're running it. Um, the simple answer is they're often done sequentially, um, but if we're running it on the cloud, then we're going to be splitting those up into separate containers and uh, yeah. aggregating results at the end. I guess conceptually, it just could be parallelized, right? Yeah. That's just a bit sure. implementation detail. Yeah. Cool. Nice question. I'm going, I'm going left to right for my Sorry. Side. Yeah. Right Hey, super awesome presentation. Two questions. How yeah. do you call the space you are in? Like, uh, what's the, is it LLM ops? Is it vector ops? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. And then the second question is uh, about latency. So, you know, you do the retrieval, there is, uh, let's say, the automatic routing or this kind of multi step query expansion. How do you guys think about performance and latency? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, well, the first step, uh, the first part of the question is, yeah, I think there's this overall like LLM ops uh, stack emerging. Um, and we're starting to see stuff on the storage side with the vector databases. There is like the orchestration and tooling side, which is like Langtrain, Llama Index, and, and some other tools with like varying degrees of like differentiation. And then there's like the LLM providers itself, right? I think for us, it's like we see kind of like their specific need for how do you like really, you know, kind of like um, create a toolkit to really figure out the data problems and specifically around like ingestion, indexing, and, and querying um, so that you can use it with language models. And so that's kind of like my view of the overall stack. Um, the latency question is very interesting. It's a good one. Um, I think in general, anything that is more agent-like is going to take longer um, because anything that requires more LLM calls is going to take longer. Um, there is kind of this hope that models will both get better, like have GPT-4 level capacity, but also with like open source models, uh, the, the, both like cost and latency will come down and become like cheaper to run. So we're kind of like banking on that future. Um, the other part is that if you want to cheat a little bit, you can use like embedding lookup instead, instead of LLM lookup for all these steps. You can use embedding lookup for the routing. You, can, you can't really do embedding lookup for the multi-step stuff. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think you can. But like there, there's certain steps that you can just like, um, not call the LLM itself, um, those will have performance trade-offs, generally speaking. And so I think it's a very valid question as uh, just like out of you know, your budget, what do you pick? Yeah. Thank you, who's next? So that last part where you mentioned defining a graph over your data, I found that really interesting. And then to connect with the first part of in-context learning, Mm -hmm. So people 
are bandwagoning on the React framework, which is fine and good. There's another line of investigation of in-context learning as Bayesian inference. And I found that connected to your uh, defining a graph over your, your data, because then you can sort of examine your data as a, as a prior. Have you thought about this? Seems like the eventual optimization step. Yeah. Got it. I, um, I'm actually not super familiar with that line of work. Um, I need to rack my brain about the Bayesian reasoning stuff again, but if you want to send me some research, I think that would be good to look at. Yeah. Definitely. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned that the collaboration with MindsDB is, is very new. What's, what's on the roadmap with that relationship as far as like functionality and you know, what are you most excited about? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I think if you look at, this is like the SQL statement to create like a, a model. Um, Right now you specify like an index, imagine specifying like an arbitrary query engine. I think that's just like an implementation detail, uh, especially with the more advanced stuff that we just showed, like the multi-step like query plan, like all that stuff. Imagine you can just run that in a MindsDB uh, engine. Um, the next part, which is just like the kind of like reverse going from natural language to SQL um, and, and basically using kind of MindsDB as a declarative interface, right? Um, so that we're actually the client that calling MindsDB um, and then MindsDB in turn can actually call Llama index. So I, I could see integration points both ways. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So with the more uh, agentic modes of handling queries, you're relying mm -hmm. a lot on characterizations of the different data stores. Is that something that's put in manually? Or are you using the LLMs to actually characterize these data stores? How does that kind of work? Yeah, I think right now, um, generally to make it modular, you put it in manually. Because if you wanted to characterize it, you could also just you know use our tool or Langtrain, I guess, to, to generate like a summary, for instance, uh, as a description. Um, and so the interface typically is like, you put in some description of the data stores with like the schema, the description, and then the LLM uses that description uh, to help itself during the query process. 